the newspaper clippings, some faded and difficult to read but every single one clear in their awe and admiration, hinted a legend in the making. Southwest Conference coaches described him as a kid who could do things they're not accustomed to seeing players do. Sports columnists called him a rare athlete, and strong, explosive, smart, and assistant Dallas Cowboys coach said during his first ever pro training camp that he was among the best we've ever had physically. And yet it is likely you do not know the player's name. Not because of what he did on the field, but because of the stand he took off of it. He was militant, one writer called him. A radical, a teammate would later say, yes, I was an activist, he says now. But I wasnt trying to change the Cowboys, just how you treat people. The man's name is Rodrigo Barnes. Today he is an assistant principal at the Garland Alternative Education Center. But 44 years ago, he played for the Dallas Cowboys for a single season as a middle linebacker. During his rookie season in 1973, the 23-year-old from Waco was a backup to a fading legend, Leroy Jordan, and was traded by October of 1974 before he vanished from pro football altogether just two years later. His official Rice University biography, penned upon his induction into that school's Hall of Fame in 2011, it notes that his career was cut short by injuries. But that is not the whole truth. Rodrigo Barnes was, he has long believed, punished for being an outspoken black man in an industry controlled by white men. He was banished for being a radical at a time when radicals weren't popular, beloved Cowboys wide receiver Drew Pearson once said. Dallas Cowboys linebacker Rodrigo Barnes 56 drops back in pass coverage during a preseason game against the Los Angeles Rams in 1973. It might be tempting to say that before there was Colin Kaepernick, there was Rodrigo Barnes, a man exiled from the game he loved. There may be a certain truth to the comparison. Both men sacrificed their pro football careers to protest the treatment of black men in America, but Barnes did so a forever ago, and, for the most part, in private, in the office of a university's president, in the locker room, in contentious meetings with an icon named Tom Landry. His revolution was not televised or tweeted, which is why history barely remembers his name. I knew I would lose money because of my activism, the 67-year-old Barnes said Wednesday evening, sipping water at the downtown Dallas Farmers Market. But I thought that the world had little justice. He was born in Waco in 1950, to parents who divorced when he was young. He remembers his father, an Army veteran, used to snap off the television whenever he heard the national anthem played. Years later, he would ask his father why. He said, I fought in World War II, Barnes said. He said, they made me promises the government, and they didnt keep them. Barnes grew up in an all-black neighborhood, and went to an all-black high school, but when he got to Rice he was only one of three black players on a team that, until his arrival, had none. When Barnes enrolled at Rice in the late 1960s, there were only three dozen black students at the whole school and but a handful in the freshman class. Had never felt more alone, and, with a few friends, organized the Black Student Union to demand the hiring of black coaches and professors at a university full of white faces. Barnes terrorized Southwest Conference opponents, a Dallas News headline from September 1969 read, Rodrigo's king of all he plays, and his own coaches, he and other ball players threatened to boycott games unless change came to Rice. Barnes also organized protests at basketball games and other sporting events, but kept the placards in the parking lot as not to embarrass the school on national television. Regardless, college officials saw Rodrigo Barnes the way White America Sam Malcolm X, Peter Golenbach wrote in his 1997 oral history Cowboys have always been my heroes. He was big and black and wasnt afraid of them. They, however, were certainly afraid of him. He graduated in 1973 with several All-Southwest Conference awards, a bachelor's degree in sociology, behavior science and health physical education, as well as a reputation as a troublemaker, Dallas News columnist John Anders wrote on February 2, 1973. Barnes has always believed that tag resulted in his slide to the seventh round so, too, did Golenbach, who wrote in his book that had Barnes not been such a militant, he would have been drafted much higher. Of this there is no doubt during his first training camp he was a standout, strong, explosive, smart. This newspaper's Bob St. John wrote in the summer of 73 about the now-rookie linebacker who has a fine career ahead of him with the Dallas Cowboys. He showed as much in the final preseason game, against the Miami Dolphins, when, as the news Sam Blair wrote, Barnes led a goal-line defense that denied the Dolphins a score. But he would never start a single game as a Cowboy. Barnes said coach Tom Landry told him early on he had no shot at succeeding Leroy Jordan. Then a decade into his career, Rodrigo Barnes starred at Rice and had a brief NFL career. 
These days, he's an assistant principal at the Garland Alternative Education Center. Barnes pushed back against Landry, telling him he came to take Jordan's job. Landry, who could be cold to players he didn't like didn't want to hear it. I was disappointed in Landry because instead of encouraging me, he discouraged me, Barnes said. Instead of taking all the good attributes I had, he fought against me. Barnes came in questioning the system, and you could see the sort of racial overtones that the system was projecting, Drew Pearson told Golenbach. What conclusions can you draw when you see they are pushing Bob Hayes out, but they were not pushing Leroy Jordan out and Rodrigo couldn't understand that? I was everything Landry wanted, Barnes said. Except I was black. By the fall of 1974, Barnes was on his way out. Sports writers were baffled. Bob St. John lamented the strange case of Rodrigo Barnes on October 19 of that year, explaining that the prominent middle linebacker had reached an impasse with Tom Landry, who said Barnes, the ultra-individualist, was unhappy because he wasn't getting playing time. Which was true enough, he ended the season as a New England Patriot, then bounced around to Miami, St. Louis and Oakland, joining the Raiders just in time to play in Super Bowl XI. By 1976, he was out of pro football, so he went back to school and got his master's degree in education. And that has been his life ever since. Barnes still watches Cowboys game, but the bitterness lingers. He harbored dreams of being a Hall of Famer he wanted to be the best who ever played. And he didn't get the chance, because he wouldn't keep quiet, wouldn't do what he was told. I felt let down by the NFL, the union, some of my teammates, he said. But it wasn't like I didn't know. I knew what could happen. Experiencing it is different, watching your dreams disappear. But my biggest disappointment was when I was a young man and realizing that because I was a black man, I was not accepted as a man in my country. That was, that is, the biggest disappointment.